Coming up on Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Rebuilding in the Keys, one family's story after the storm that left many starting from scratch. Plus, Irma prompted one of the biggest evacuations in U.S. history. How emergency planners say they'll get the evacuation message out better next time. And is your home as hurricane ready as you think? The surprising things Irma taught us about what it means to be prepared. Now, Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Welcome and thank you for joining us. It is June the 1st and that means that if hurricane season is officially here, although Alberto brought us a little unofficial start a little early. Yeah, we are here with you live for the next hour. Rick and I, along with Chief Meteorologist Craig Setzer and the CBS 4 News team, we're going to provide you with the information you need to survive this hurricane season. For many, the 2017 hurricane season was a life changing moment. After more than a decade of close calls, we felt the direct impact of a major hurricane. Many people lost homes and a lifetime of memories. CBS 4's David Sutta rode out Irma in one of the hardest hit areas, the Florida Keys. Tonight we look at what has happened there since then. This story starts with the tree, the mango tree that saved Gilberto and Cheryl Suarez's life. Thank goodness for the mango trees. It was Father's Day. Gilberto Suarez was reaching for mangoes for a family gathering. He fell, broke his hip, shattered his wrist congestive heart failure the next day, they airlifted him out of there. He would spend weeks in the hospital and when Hurricane Irma ripped across his home on Big Pine Key, because he had rehab, he was with his son in Coral Springs. I woke up the next morning, I was looking at Facebook like normal and I just saw the video, I was like, wow, couldn't believe it. Uh, we just stumbled across this, what's left of a house. You have your heart there. You have you know, all your belongings, you know, for my parents. To, to lose everything, it was hard. I don't see anybody around here. I worked so hard as a teacher to save the money to build, to pay for the, my building, my home, where I raised my children, and they had nothing. And they were not alone. For so many who live in this paradise, the risk had finally caught up to them. I'm not sure the people that went through the storm will ever truly be over it. Nine months after the hurricane, much of the Lower Keys is still struggling. The hardest thing to come by is a contractor. And so now they're being put on waiting list of up to two to three years. And the whole time they're living in a travel trailer in their driveway, and they're just waiting for this misery to end. With thousands of residents now living in trailers, Centerfit is concerned. Even a tropical storm is gonna create a much greater hazard for us here in the Florida Keys because we've got people that are in such at-risk dwellings. He says Irma taught them a few lessons. First, the electrical main lines took a direct hit from a Category 4 storm and survived. Second, the process for returning home post-storm needs to change. He's rolling out a survivor training course. Those who take it will get to return first. They come in almost as a responder instead of a civilian. For many, reality is too much to bear. It's estimated between 10 and 20 percent of the Keys residents have left. It was impossible for us to go back. Including the Suarez family, with just a suitcase of clothes to their name. Tamarack is very different. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes it is, it's a nice retirement community. We play shuffleboard twice a day, we walk. <laughs> <laughs> While they may be more than 100 miles away, you can see the conch is still very alive here. Gil has plans to one day rebuild the family home. And it's not if, it's gonna be one. A place where the kids and grandkids can connect and eat mangoes from the mango tree that saved grandpa and grandma's life. He'll tell the kids, see the tree? Be careful. <laughs> to this day, they do not know what started the fire in the Suarez home. They only know that the fire started after the storm had passed. The 2017 hurricane season taught us a lot about construction. Newer homes seem to fare better in all of this, but the older homes, they didn't stand a chance, especially against all of the water. One can hope this 2018 season is more forgiving, especially as folks are rebuilding here in the Florida Keys. In the Florida Keys, I'm David Sutta, CBS 4 News. One of the keys to be properly prepared for a storm is to know your zone. That's your evacuation zone. And as Irma approached, Miami-Dade County emergency managers told tens of thousands of people to evacuate. Some thought they could have done a better job of spreading that message. CBS 4's Lauren Pastrana reports on what officials will do differently next time. Lines around buildings, shelters at capacity, and highways packed with cars, all reminders of the mass exodus ahead of Irma. This is a life-threatening situation. 
the storm surge will rush in and could kill you. If you have been ordered to evacuate, now is the time to evacuate. Some waited until the last minute, despite repeated warnings from emergency managers, like those who work here at the Miami-Dade Emergency Operations Center. Hurricane Irma triggered an unprecedented mobilization of resources. The EOC's interim director, Charles Cyril, says they've spent the last few months working on ways to reach residents. We want to communicate better with our residents. Communication is the key. This area of Miami was the first zone told to evacuate in anticipation of Irma. Know your zone now. Don't wait for a hurricane to hit you. Once it hit, streets were flooded and residents who stayed behind despite the order were stuck in their homes. Cyril says some were confused about what knowing your zone really means. We want them to check their storm surge planning zone. This is your potential threat. The evacuation order will always be a subset of what you're looking at now. All of that information is online and now a new mobile app will provide vital info for evacuees. Everyone should download the Ready Miami-Dade County app um, and they'll have information up to date and, and that was one of our key lessons learned. Communicating with the public and that timely information is, is what we learned and we, we're working on improving that. Through the app, you'll be able to see exactly which shelters are already up and running as well as which grocery and drug stores are still open for business. If your zone is told to evacuate, no need to leave the state or even the county. We don't have to go hundreds of miles like some did for Irma. We want you to just go tens of miles. The number of shelters available and their locations will vary by storm and space will be limited. They will have the bare minimum uh, amenities. There are lifeboats, not cruise ships. We want you to wait out the storm at an evacuation center, but don't think we're going to stay there for an extended period of time. Again, one of the most important things you can do as we gear up for another hurricane season is to know your zone. You can find out that information at miamidade.gov slash OEM. That way you know if you'll need to evacuate in case of a storm. At the Miami-Dade Emergency Operations Center, Lauren Pastrana, CBS 4 News. Evacuation zones in Broward County are simpler thanks to the shape and elevation of the coastline. Typically, residents west of US-1 do not need to evacuate. However, anyone in a mobile home should evacuate no matter where they live if a hurricane warning is issued. And here's another option to see if you live in an evacuation zone in Miami-Dade or Broward. Just go to the Hurricane News section at our website, cbsmiami.com. Click on the Evacuation Zone Interactive Map and then enter your address and zip code. So what is the forecast for this hurricane season? CBS 4 Chief Meteorologist Craig Setzer joining us now. Craig. Well, there's two things we're looking at as we go into this hurricane season, and they won't, we won't really know for sure how it's going to turn out in terms of these two things until we get a little bit further into the season. First off, this is our main development region. This is where the big, the devastating hurricanes typically develop and come from, and it's the ocean temperatures in these areas that we watch closely. Right now, it's near normal temperatures in the Caribbean and it's far western Atlantic, but over here, Central and Eastern Tropical Atlantic, the water temperatures are well below normal. We know from history that when the water here is cooler, the hurricane season is less active. But here are the typical major hurricane tracks. Of course, a major hurricane is category three, four, or five and does the major amount of damage. So we're going to be watching that water out there very carefully. The other water we're going to be watching it's here in the El Nina zone. It's the tropical Pacific right near the equator, and the ocean temperatures right now are indicating near normal conditions. Now, we had a bit of a La Nina last year, but the forecast is for weak El Nino conditions this year. And El Nino creates this disruptive wind shear. We didn't have much of any wind shear last year. The storms just marched to the west uninterrupted. But this year, the computer models, here they are, showing that there is a forecast for a weak El Nino. This is the time frame we're looking here, August, September, October. You can see the majority of the members above that line there, the La Nina El Nino line. So two things we're going to be watching as we go into the season. Is the Eastern Atlantic going to be cool? Is it going to stay cool? It would be less active. Is the El Nino going to develop? If it does, then we would see a less active season. But for now, uh, the Colorado State forecast is for a near normal season. They'll be watching that water out there. Also, the state of El Nino, they're calling for 14 named storms, six hurricanes, two major we normally have 12 named storms, seven hurricanes, and two major hurricanes. That's a normal season. Okay, so only the first day of hurricane season. What are the factors that could change the outlook of this so season? So the things we'll be watching will be that El Nino, and we won't know that until later in the year. In fact, here's what uh, the graph shows. That's our typical hurricane season. By July, that's when we have our highest forecast skill for the hurricane season. 
that's when we better know the state of the El Nino or in some cases a La Nina. But hurricane season doesn't ramp up, ramp up for another month. It's usually in uh, August where things really start getting active. Now, some people like to take a look at seasonal cycles, uh, like the one that apparently began back in 1995. It was forecast to last for about 20 to 25 years, a more active cycle than what we had seen before that. So. Do you think that we might be approaching anytime soon a less active cycle? Well, it's possible. Now, here's a look back at some of the hurricane cycles. This is from 1900 to 1950, and we had a ton of major hurricanes go through South Florida, especially in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But then after that, we went through a period where there was less, active, less activity, and then there's been a little bit of an uptick recently. It's kind of one of those things where you don't really know until you're in it, mm -hmm. but it looks like this year, maybe, hopefully, we'll have a less active season. Well, I hope so. Understand more when you see the graphics like that. Yeah. So thank you, Craig. Yep. Thanks, Craig. And another <laughs> invaluable source of important information, particularly during hurricane season, is the CBS Miami weather app. There you can find local conditions such as wind, cloud cover, hourly forecasts, and the radar app, which allows you to zoom in and see where activity is and where it's headed. Well, prep Preparation, as you've heard, is key, and no one knows that better than South Florida's emergency responders. And that is why each year before the season starts, the Miami-Dade EOC holds its annual hurricane drill. CBS4 meteorologist Dave Warren was there. It looks like the real thing, a potentially catastrophic storm approaching the area while over 70 local and state agencies work to prepare for the storm. Not to worry today, however, this is just a drill. The Miami-Dade Emergency Operations Center created this situation to work through the problems that may come with it. We always tweak our processes, and every time we find new challenges, and we try to work through those. So there's never a perfect storm, there's never a perfect plan, and so we try to work through these, these issues to make our plans better. Trying to make it as real as possible, they have controllers who inject certain scenarios into the drill. Observers analyze how that scenario is handled and if it could be done better. It may seem hard to think about preparing for the next storm with some areas having not recovered from Irma last season. Issa Mendez is with FEMA. A guest at the drill says you need to be doing exactly that. The more prepared we are and the more we plan things ahead of time, it's going to be a lot better for us to face any eventual emergency that may happen. And making sure everyone is prepared for the next emergency, well, that's the key message. From emergency services down to the individual. The time to prepare is now, when we have blue skies, no threat, no warning, and uh, that's, the, that's the biggest message to everybody. Well, every storm is different, and there is no perfect scenario. The hope is that from lessons learned from past storms and drills like this, they can perfect their response to every situation before, during, and after a storm. In Miami, I'm Dave Warren for CBS4 News. Still ahead on Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Home storm preps, which ones work and which ones don't. What we found after Irma was surprising, especially if you have hurricane impact windows. It's the defining tragedy of Irma, the deaths of so many at a Hollywood nursing home. Could it happen again? And the only lifeline for many in the Keys during Irma was a battery powered radio. We'll look at the vital role stations like US One Radio play in a storm. You're watching Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Everywhere you live, somewhere there's something. There's an Irma for everybody somewhere in their life. So not really, um, just preparing a little bit better for it this time. If there was a single tragedy that defined Hurricane Irma, it was the deaths of at least a dozen people after the loss of power knocked out the air conditioning at the Hollywood Hills nursing home. So has anything changed? CBS4's Jim DeFeedy covered the nursing home tragedy last year. He went back looking for answers. The images are unforgettable. Nursing home residents drenched in sweat being wheeled into the parking lot of the rehabilitation center at Hollywood Hills. Four people died inside the home. At least eight more perished within hours of being evacuated. This incident was in the making for years. State Senator Gary Farmer represents Hollywood and the surrounding area. It goes back to the deregulation of the nursing home industry in general. One thing with capitalism, uh, if there's no financial downside, if there's no accountability, uh, responsibility tends to wane. 
Farmer and others in the legislature tried to pass what they considered meaningful nursing home reform, but they couldn't even get their bill to the floor of the legislature for a vote. What was actually accomplished in Tallahassee? Really not much. The one thing the legislature did was pass a bill requiring nursing homes to have backup generators. Farmers said it was little more than a stunt because federal regulations were going to require nursing homes this year to have backup generators anyway. And we had uh, uh, the audacity to pass a bill that gives them some tax relief for buying a generator that they were really already required to have. So they got a financial break to comply with the law. Uh, that's how special interests work in Tallahassee. They tend to obfuscate things, they tend to distract people from the true issues, and then uh, they pass something and they claim it's reform when it's really not. Sadly, Farmer notes, the legislature continues to allow the nursing homes to essentially be on the honor system when it comes to protecting their residents. Okay, we've got a requirement under state law that you have an emergency plan in place. But nobody goes to these facilities uh, to inspect them and ensure that they have the supplies, the resources, the training to implement the emergency plan when it becomes needed. And so, yeah, Jim, I'm, I'm fearful that uh, this could happen again because we haven't addressed this uh, problem or this potential tragedy happening again in the way we should. And Jim joins us now on our set. So why hasn't more been done in Tallahassee? Look, uh, Representative or Senator Farmer really touches on it. One of the things you have to realize is the industry is incredibly powerful. Also, the legislature was really distracted. If you remember the beginning of the session, there were a number of sex scandals that really rocked the place and caused a bit of paralysis, and then the Parkland shooting happened. And once the Parkland shooting happened, all of the energy and momentum from the legislature that the nursing home tried to get going really got sucked up by that issue. So what specific reforms would have made a difference? You know, he touched on one that was very important. One of the things that we learned about the Hollywood Hills nursing home was that they had an emergency plan, but their emergency plan had been photocopied time and time and time again. And there was nobody who was actually visiting these homes to try to determine if they knew what they were doing, if they were re actually prepared to implement them. For instance, you can't just have in your emergency plan a line that says, you know, if our power goes out, we'll go out and buy a generator. That doesn't work, in, you know, in a storm when everyone's trying to do it. Another thing they could have done that they would have really liked, he says that there's a bill that's going out through in Georgia now to have national cams, you know, those hidden cameras that you could place in a room. That right now, Florida does not allow that to happen. Hmm, interesting. All right, Jim DeFeedy, thanks very much for going back to the nursing sure. home and getting us some information. And let's talk a little bit about insurance and insurance issues after Irma. The Florida Office of Insurance Regulation estimates that the price tag for insurance companies will be about $8.6 billion. Yet an analysis by CBS4 News shows that seven months after the storm, Florida homeowners are having a hard time getting those claims paid. Of the more than 228,000 claims that have been filed in Miami-Dade, Broward, and Monroe counties, only 48 percent have been paid. Even more striking, more than a third of claims were denied, mostly because people hadn't yet met their deductibles. While in the Keys recently, CBS 4 News heard complaints from people still fighting to get their claims covered. Here is Key West Mayor Craig Cates. Insurance is always a problem uh, down here when you have flood insurance and you have uh, wind insurance of two different companies that keep pointing the finger at each other. I've heard a lot of stories of low ball and claims and you got to get an adjuster to help you or an attorney and that costs you money. It's very unfortunate the citizens have to go through that. If you are still having trouble or have questions about your insurance coverage or claims, call Florida's Insurance Consumer Helpline. The number is 1-877-MY-FL-CFO or 1-877-693-5236. Or you can log on to MyFloridaCFO.com. I'm CBS 4 meteorologist Aset Gonzalez. If you have to evacuate, you may need to make arrangements for your pets. Try to take your animal with you. Do not leave them alone at home. If you're heading to a pet friendly shelter, your pets must be pre registered. Also, make sure your pet's collar has an ID tag that they have been microchipped and that all of their prescriptions have been filled. And if you will need evacuation assistance or require specialized transportation to evacuate, you must also pre register for that. Visit CBSMiami.com for a link to the forms that you have to fill out or call 311 for more information.
Still ahead on Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Are you unsure how to prep your boat when a storm threatens? Craig is taking to the water with the do's and don'ts you need to know. Riding out the storm. On the radio, one station was there for people in the Keys during Irma. You'll meet the man behind the microphone. And when Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico, South Florida became a refuge for survivors. We'll have one family's emotional story. This is Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. A little bit more anxious because last year was pretty bad. Uh, so this year, hopefully it won't be as bad as last year. <laughs> Welcome back. One of the more devastating hurricanes last year was Harvey. Harvey is tied with Katrina as the costliest tropical cyclone on record. It caused $125 billion in damage, primarily from catastrophic flooding in the Houston metro area. Harvey made landfall in Texas as a Category 4 hurricane on August 26th. It weakened and lingered over southeast Texas for four days, dumping as much as 60 inches of rain. Harvey was responsible for the deaths of 107 people, an estimated 300,000 structures, and 500,000 vehicles were damaged or destroyed in Texas alone. Across the Caribbean, recovery is still underway from the 2017 hurricane season. Before making landfall in Florida, Irma bashed Cuba as a Category 5, packing 160 mile an hour winds. Havana's famous seawall was swamped by the monster storm, and water was pushed nearly a third of a mile inland, flooding, even destroying some neighborhoods. The U.S. Coast Guard was called to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands after Irma's winds knocked down power lines and flattened homes. Residents were forced to stand in line for hours to get water and gasoline. On St. Martin, 5,000 U.S. citizens were stranded for a time. Americans were told to show up at the airport with only a passport and a small carry-on bag. With power issues and no running water, evacuees waited for days to leave. Let's talk about Hurricane Maria on the heels of Irma. As you remember, Maria was a one-two punch for much of the Caribbean. This was the view from above Dominica, which revealed widespread destruction. Maria slamming the tiny island as a Category 5 hurricane with 175 mile an hour winds. It's regarded as Dominica's worst natural disaster on record. And Maria holds the same distinction for the island of Puerto Rico. Rico, the U.S. Commonwealth's long recovery is ongoing. Many Puerto Ricans were forced to leave home for good, and many of them ended up here in Florida. CBS 4's Elliot Rodriguez has one family's emotional story. Hurricane Maria was a Category 4 storm when it made landfall in Puerto Rico last September, plunging the island into a humanitarian crisis. And then we went outside, and it was... I mean, devastation. It was like a bomb was, you know, there. When the storm hit, Vivian Rivera was in the town of Comerio in the mountainous central part of the island. Her hometown was left unrecognizable by hurricane force winds and torrential rains that turned streams into raging rivers. We just decided to, to take a walk, me and my cousin. And uh, we cry all the way. I mean, it was, ah. Maria was the worst natural disaster ever to hit the U.S. territory. The storm knocked down 80% of the island's power transmission lines. Millions were left with no electricity, cell phone service, medicine, food, or water. We didn't have any water, we didn't have any electricity, so we didn't have a way to communicate with police, uh, a family, uh, I mean, there were no phones, uh, no way to go in the car anywhere because the roads were blocked with, you know, all, all the mud slime and the trees and uh, electric poles. Getting aid to the island proved challenging, but getting the aid out of the capital of San Juan was an almost insurmountable obstacle, leaving Puerto Ricans out of touch with the rest of the world and feeling hopeless and forgotten. It was really scary. It was like we were in another place, you know, like isolated. Maria forced thousands of Puerto Ricans to leave for places like Florida. Vivian lives in Hollywood, but her 89-year-old mother Rosa remains in Puerto Rico, as do other family members who are still dealing with power outages and water shortages. 
some days they get up in the morning and they don't have electricity mm -hmm. so the whole day without without electricity they you know lose the groceries and stuff and uh, then the next day they, they do have electricity or they don't have water so it's like a day by day thing you know Vivian shudders to think what a new hurricane season will bring to Puerto Rico. If another hurricane comes, I mean, it's going to be gone again. All these months after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, the death toll remains a mystery. The official count is 64, but many people, including the mayor of San Juan, believe the number is much higher. And this past Wednesday, Harvard University researchers said the death toll for Maria is dramatically higher than reported. The study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, estimates more than 4,600 people died in Puerto Rico. Elliot Rodriguez, CBS4 News. Still ahead on Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Hurricane anxiety. Are you and your family already feeling it? See how coping with the concern is easier than you think. Is your home as hurricane ready as it needs to be? Some surprising tips from an expert to help you be better prepared. And he was the calm during the storm. Bill Becker made US One Radio a lifeline for listeners during Irma. We're talking to him next. This is Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Here again are Rick Fobom and Rudabe Shabazi. Welcome back. As you put together your plan to prepare your home for what might come our way this hurricane season, there are lessons to be taken from last season. We asked a team of hurricane damage inspectors to share with us which preparations worked and which didn't. What we found was surprising, especially when it comes to hurricane impact resistant windows. Here's CBS 4's David Sutta. John McCallie has been inspecting hurricane damaged homes and repairs since Hurricane Andrew. And this past year, his team was quite busy. You guys have done a few inspections since Irma? Uh, about 400, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a couple. What have you seen coming out of those reports? Wow, it's been over 10 years since we've had really a major, major storm hit us here. And, and what we found is that the, you know, the upgrades to the building code and the, and, and the changes we've made to the way we build actually have really, really helped. That is the good news. For those who did have damage, McCauley says much of it was preventable. We asked him to show us what he meant by that. A tree will, will do a lot of damage. If a tree could touch a roof, I've literally seen where a tree will rub through a shingle roof over a period of hours, just constantly rubbing. McCauley recommends you trim the trees now. It'll not only keep the limbs off your roof, the tree may be able to withstand the storm. This particular home suffered over 200 damaged tiles. The fix for this? Get your roof inspected. Most roofers will do this for free in hopes if you do need a repair, you'll hire them. What's happened is the mortar dries out over time, over you know heating and cooling every day, and it loses its adhesiveness and its ability to withstand. So normally a roof that could withstand 100 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour may fail at 60. Another item he saw post Irma was water. 100 mile an hour wind driven horizontally for hours on end came through this garage flooded this garage, damaged stuff. You know, people put stuff in the garage thinking, well, put it in the garage, it's all safe, it's fine. Well, to best we could tell, it was about an inch and a half of water in this garage for, you know, hours. John recommends stuffing towels into vents. Even if they are soaked, it will keep water from flowing in. He recommends doing the same for your windows. What would happen is the water would enter the track driven by 100 mile an hour wind. It has a drain, but it can only drain out so fast, or maybe there's debris in there, and then water will inundate the track and pour into the home. And about those impact windows with high price tags, Irma showed us they may not be worth it. They found that the windows had actually been sandblasted by the debris and thousands of, of little scratches and nicks. There's no way to salvage that kind of window. Uh, not that we know of at this point. You really can't polish the glass. Lastly, John recommends checking the seals on all your doors, windows, and sliding door tracks. A majority of their post Irma inspections dealt with situations where water got into homes and created chaos. Uh, mold needs two things. It needs moisture and food. The food is always here. You probably couldn't make a better food than drywall for mold. 
It's hard to imagine putting storm shutters up over hurricane impact glass. It just seems kind of crazy. One final note from personal experience. If you have storm shutters, you want to make sure that you have all the hardware, the screws and the bolts and the nuts to make sure you have that already. You don't want to be the person at the hardware store trying to find that last box when a storm is approaching. From the Florida Keys, David Sutta, CBS 4 News. Some good information. And I remember when we first moved to South Florida, we had the, the, the shutters in our garage and a VHS tape that was <laughs> how to, put them to up. instruct us. And I'm like, who has a VHS player to even watch the tape? That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right, moving now from dry land to the water, and it's time to talk about boat preps. All right, and we have our resident boater here, Craig. So what do boat owners need to know, Craig? Well, hurricanes are a threat boat owners in South Florida must live with, and Irma taught boat owners a lot. A little over a decade of not having a hurricane, you kind of forget what happens, what it's like. John Michael Cornell knows firsthand what a hurricane can do to a boat. He's the general manager at Hurricane Cove Marina and Boatyard. During Irma, there, there was this, you know, based just on the size of the storm and what was happening out in the outer islands, um, there was a, an immense amount of fear. So it's a learning process. Um, every storm's different um, based on size, based on the length of time, the amount of rainfall, surge, all of these different factors come into play, but it's just constantly learning from, from you know, the learning experiences that we've been given. Maria Busto is the interim marina manager for the city of Miami. Irma taught me a lot. Irma taught me that you can't ever think it's not going to hit, number one. And nothing is too small, or not enough prep is enough. Because we did everything we could, and there was still not enough. During the height of the storm, Irma's wind, waves, and surge took their toll at Dinner Key Marina, especially Pier 1. It was just a complete mess. Everything was everywhere. So going into the 2018 season, what do boaters need to know? The first thing I would recommend any boater doing is they need to talk with their dock master or marina manager as far as what their plan is. Um, and then from there, they also need to have a personal plan, a checklist of what they need to do. Uh, additional dock lines are a must. I recommend you know new lines, also a size larger than what they're doing uh, normally using. And then uh, from from there, you know removing anything that can be obviously blown away. Any boater needs to make sure that their boat is is operating correctly in the first place. Uh, other things that they need to be considered about is, is looking at the boats around them and making sure that that you know their boats are tied. You know know your neighbors, know who you're docking next to, um, have their their contact information because. A boat next to you, if it's not done correctly, it can also damage your boat. Um, so it's just kind of being mindful of, of who, you know, what, what your surroundings are, essentially. A lot to and, think about. Yeah, and the one thing they really said, and the big advice was, do it early when the storm's coming. Don't wait till the last minute with a hurricane in a boat. And a lot of people do that, unfortunately, yeah, every year we see it. Across the board, not just about boats. That's mm -hmm. right. All right, so hopefully everybody's listening. Thank you very much, Craig. Well, after last year's hyperactive season, does the mere thought of a hurricane coming to South Florida stress you out? If you went through Irma and are suffering from hurricane anxiety, you're not alone. CBS4's Dave Warren spoke with an expert about how to deal with it. Anxiety literally equals what if, right? So we go through all these scenarios in our head and we say, what's the worst case scenario? Dr. Daniel Bober is a psychiatrist. He says that for some, that worst case scenario played out last year. I think after Irma, people have become even more sensitized to this process and are even more scared when they see hurricane season start. In the Keys, where the recovery is ongoing, the mayor of Key West is concerned. There is a lot more anxiety over it, only because if we get hit with another one as bad as Irma or worse, it could be devastating for our economy. This couple from Kudjo Key, ground zero for Irma, described the anxiety they are feeling even now. Chest tightening, you can't breathe, you're like the not knowing, it's just like, is it is it going to happen again? Um, it, it's just a lot of things, it's a lot of factors. The anxiety is there, especially with a set start date and even after Irma happened last year. But residents who've lived here year after year, well, they find a way to deal with it. I feel like a lot of locals here are more aware and we are more cautious coming up with a new hurricane season. Makes you a little nervous. We are hurricane ready. Getting ready for a hurricane means preparing. You don't really get anxious until it's out there, until it's three days away, but you know this time of year you start getting extra canned goods, you start when you go to Sam's, you buy an extra case of water, you start stocking up now. Anxiety really is about a sense of a loss of control. So you want to plan ahead, you want to prepare, and you want to do things that make you feel like you're empowered so that you're ready for when the storm comes. That's the best way to deal with the anxiety. Dave Warren, CBS 4 News.
Information can be a powerful tool to help you deal with hurricane anxiety, and we can help you with that. You can always connect with CBS4 on Facebook and Twitter, as well as CBSMiami.com. Our website's hurricane section is a comprehensive resource. You can find everything you need to help you with your family's hurricane plan. Earlier in the program, we talked briefly about insurance issues and concerns that homeowners are still having after Irma. So please welcome now Dulce Suarez Resnick. She is with NCF Insurance Associates. Welcome. Thank Thanks you for, for being coming. Here. Thank you for having me. So, what are the top three things that homeowners and business owners need to know going into hurricane season? Well, they need to prepare. And right now, uh, since today's the first day of hurricane season, they really need to do a quick analysis of the coverages they have in place. One of the big things that we saw during Irma is that a lot of people didn't know, including small businesses, what coverages they did have and what coverage, what deductibles they had, and therefore they were a little surprised going through the process of filing their claims. So now is the time to call your insurance agent, do a coverage review, review your deductibles. Some people found out there were some coverages they didn't have. They didn't have flood insurance or they didn't have windstorm insurance because they no longer had a mortgage or the flood map had changed and they decided not to carry it. So it was very surprising to them. And you don't want to find out what your coverages are and aren't or what your deductibles are at the time of a storm. Right, okay, so let's talk about homeowners in particular because we did mention a large number, about a third of the claims filed in Miami-Dade and Broward and Monroe have still not been paid. They were denied by insurance companies, uh, refusing to pay anything. Part of the reason was the deductibles had not been met. Uh, but what can homeowners do to make sure they're protected after a storm? Well, that's why they should do their review now. Uh, you, need to, you really need to know what coverages you have on your policy. Not every policy is the same. And you have some carriers that exclude certain things and some carriers that actually include, for example, fences. A lot of companies don't cover fences, but some do. Um, some companies will cover coverage for debris removal to a certain percentage. Some cover only $1,000 or $500. It all depends on the policy you have. So now is the time to, to really look at your policy. Before we had a cookie cutter policy, I'm talking before Hurricane Andrew, everything was there. Things have changed dramatically since Andrew and again after the 2004-2005 hurricane season. So you really need to know. And it is tricky. It can be counterintuitive uh, when Absolutely. you go back and look at your policy. Absolutely. So do you recommend people deal with their insurance company directly or instead hire an adjuster themselves to go through and review no. everything? In a hurricane, no. The first thing you want to do in the event of a hurricane is you want to call the insurance company immediately and have your claim registered. And at that point, and if you can't get through the insurance company, contact your agent. Your agent can sometimes do put in your claim online, and then it's registered right away. At that point, let the insurance company do what they need to do. Let them do their estimates. If you have, if you're not in agreement with their estimates, call your agent. Have your agent assist. We can assist in getting your claim processed. And if you're not happy, then call the insurance consumer hotline, which you guys uh, referenced a little mm -hmm. while ago in the program. They will also help you. We'll say real quickly, we only have a couple seconds, is the insurance industry ready for this hurricane season? I want to say that in, in most parts they are. One of the biggest problems that we had last year and, and we're trying to fix that now is the lack of adjusters. Hmm. Um, imagine that, you know, if you have a big, big storm come this way, you might have issues with availability and affordability of insurance. Dulce Suarez Resnick is with NCF Insurance Associates. Dulce, always nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Still ahead on Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Powerful lesson. After the most stressful test of its power grid, what FP&L is saying before the lights go out again. Plus, the message the new Hurricane Center director wants us all to hear. And we look at the role radio stations like US-1 and the Keys can play in a storm. Why they remain a vital lifeline for listeners. Next. Welcome back to Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. And when the leading edge of Hurricane Irma struck the Florida Keys, it almost immediately knocked out power, leaving residents in the Keys without access to information from the internet or television. But as CBS 4's Jim DeFiti reports, thanks to a man behind a microphone at a radio station, they were not alone. It is uh, 1.33 in the morning on a Sunday morning here. Bill Becker and Ron Saunders uh, 
Coming to you live from our studios on Upper Sugarloaf Key. The only way people knew they weren't alone was the sound of Bill Becker's voice on US1 Radio. Reporting live here from our studios. Providing them a calm but candid assessment of what they should expect as the worst of the winds approached. That's the stark reality of what we're facing here right now. People who had battery-powered radio said they, they slept with their radio. They hunkered down with their radio to listen to us, to, to just hear somebody in the darkness. This was the only means of communication for everybody. We were basically back to the stone ages of communications. There was nothing else except this radio station. It was pretty incredible. Becker shot this video from the station's window during the storm. And in the morning, when the eye of the hurricane passed right over the radio station. Well, here we are, the eye of the storm. The Becker took a quick break to go outside and see for himself. Boy, this is amazing. We have incredible destruction all around here, but we're still looking at the backside of the uh, storm coming at us. So we'll do our best to stay on the air here in US1 Radio. 40 minutes in the eye of the hurricane. And some people said they thought the storm was over and we're gonna go out till they heard us tell them, this is the eye of the hurricane, don't go out in it. That warning likely saved lives. For Becker, who has been the news director since 1980, this was the worst storm he has ever encountered. He said he felt a duty to stay on the air because he knew people would be counting on him. And that was even more the case once the storm cleared. We're here in the studio. If you want to come by, tell us your story, tell us your need. We had people lining up at our outside our studio here to get on the air with us to relay messages to their loved ones, find out where people were, find out what services were available. My name is Sean. Uh, we rode out the storm in uh, Big Torx there and uh, <clears throat> water was coming pouring through the windows. I thought the house was going to come off the stilts. Uh, we were praying and we just thank God that it didn't. Local officials came by as well, providing updates on what was happening. And when the station's generator ran low on gas, Becker put out a distress call for help. We had people siphoning the gasoline from their boats so they could keep us on the air. Becker said he is proud of what the station accomplished. I feel like we did something really special here, being able to stay on the air. And uh, we're going to do it. We're going to harden our system here. We're going to do the best we can to be there next time as well. Wow, isn't that great? And for their incredible work during the storm, Becker and his colleagues at the station recently won the very prestigious Murrow Award. Unbelievable, his yeah. commitment and how what a lifeline he was for so many people. Yeah, and it goes to show the part of your hurricane plan you need to have also is the radio, the portable radio, battery powered. I had friends that said we were listening to CBS4 being rebroadcast with a crank radio, and every time it'd wow. be quiet, they'd start cranking it up again. So radio is crucial to have. Yeah, I heard the same thing from so many people who had lost power, but were able to listen to to our coverage on, right. on a radio key right. and it helps you to feel connected uh, during a time where there's a lot of anxiety. So our CBS radio partners in Miami-Dade and Broward are 99.9 .9 KISS Country, Power 96.5 and 560 WQAM Sports Radio. And here are our radio partners in the Keys, which we are proud to say includes US1 Radio. You can find the list of all of our radio partners on our website, cbsmiami.com. And if a hurricane warning is issued for us, South Florida PBS WPPT2 will broadcast CBS4 and MyTV33 storm coverage with captioning on the screen at all times. We'll be right back.
You're watching Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Welcome back. Irma proved to be quite a challenge for Florida Power and Light. In fact, Irma was the most stressful test of the utilities power grid ever. I talked to its CEO, Eric Sillergy, about that. We're going to continue to invest in technology. We're going to continue to harden the system. We're going to continue to underground where we can. And we're going to continue to aggressively manage on trees and growth. Many remember the fallout from the power disruption after Irma, but FPL says they did the best they could given the size and strength of the storm. During Irma, we had 4.4 million customers. 9 million FPLers were knocked out of power. As FPLers, customers served by FPL. We had half of all customers restored in 24 hours. But you know what? You can learn from every storm, and we're going to get better at it. So what about the next time a hurricane hits here? There are no guarantees, and anybody who tells you there's a guarantee is not telling you the truth on this. The guarantee is, is that there will be power interruptions for some people during a major hurricane. That I can guarantee you. I'm CBS 4 meteorologist Asad Gonzalez. If the power goes out, a portable home generator after a hurricane can be invaluable, but it can also be dangerous. And here's what you need to know if you have to use one. Run your generator at least 10 feet from your home. Never use it in an enclosed patio, garage, or under an eave, and use recommended extension cords. Store the gasoline for it safely, use a fuel stabilizer, and have a working carbon monoxide detector. If you have a generator, now would be a good time to check and make sure it works. For more information, go to our website, cbsmiami.com. Nice. Good advice there because the generators can be lifesavers, but they can also be dangerous. Well, the National Hurricane Center has a brand new director. Ken Graham has only been on the job since April 1st. Prior to that, he led the National Weather Service's New Orleans area forecast office. I had a chance to sit down with Ken Graham. Here's his takeaway from Irma, and it's a good message for all of us. There's always the, the hurricane that becomes your benchmark. And I, I think we've got to be careful with that. I think we need to really be able to understand not to compare the previous hurricane to the next because they're all completely different. So just because something didn't happen to you with, with Irma doesn't mean it couldn't happen next time. Or if you got some big impacts, it may not happen next time. Hmm. Now, what is his role, uh, Mr. Graham? So he is now the director of the National Hurricane Center. We had Ed Rappaport, the acting director, through the busy hurricane season last year. So Ken is now the official director of the National Hurricane Center. Which means, practically speaking, as a storm is coming. We'll see his face a lot, and we don't want to see his face a lot. <laughs> yeah, kind of gives me anxiety, I have to admit, just seeing those yeah. pictures there. Seems like a very nice guy. He's a very yes. nice guy. So as we go to break, uh, here is the list of this season's storm names. And we'll be right back. And that's going to do it for Hurricane 2018, learning from Irma. Thank you for joining us. And Craig, you have some closing thoughts to share. I do. Well, after years of me telling you at the end of each hurricane special that we need to be ready, I'm going to say it again. Despite that what most of us was a brush with the hurricane for most of us, we still need to be ready. In fact, as long as we live in South Florida, we will always need to be ready. No one should ever be surprised when a hurricane threatens, much less be surprised when one hits here. But if we're ready, we will do much better getting through it. Thanks for watching and be ready. All right. Good night. Thanks for joining Good us. Night.